other schools also these schools are there sir namaskar to everyone i anita sharma principal of sd public school pitampura welcome all viewers of asds dream big talks this platform brings eminent people from different professions who has created niche in the world due to their exemplary work to combat the lockdown anxieties sdps has taken the initiative to facilitate the conversation between the stalwarts of the society and young impressionable minds theme for today's talk is milestones the journey of being today we have very special guest my teacher my mentor and my guru professor dinesh singh with us sir has been the chancellor he is right now the chancellor of kr mangalam university and he had been the 21st vice chancellor of university of delhi is fellow of hack space at MP imperial college london adjunct professor of mathematics at university of houston for his services to the nation he was conferred with padma shri fourth highest award by government of india he was instrumental in bringing many innovations in university of delhi the most noted one is setting up of cluster innovation center at the university of delhi this is an interdisciplinary research center and it is particularly promoting undergraduate research it is said that teachers help not by their just teachings they also influenced by their examples and their power to communicate their own experience so in the course of training the students the teachers who evolve from swar to sarveshyam raise to higher consciousness attain the level of guru or master and become indispensable for society learning from them will always lead one on path of wisdom and from darkness to light i invite friend philosopher guide and my guru to share his journey of be to being with to being with you all sir thank you thank you very much anita for this very generous introduction let me assure the audience that anita is always generous in her introductions particularly when it comes to me <laughs> if there is anything special i've done in life it is my claim that anita has been my student so i reflect in her glory and i'm delighted to be having this opportunity to talk to young minds i believe that you are the future of this nation and we have great expectations from you anita asked me to speak to you the young audience on my own journey in life and i thought that if i really wish to do something that is worthwhile it would be far better if i gave you the context in which all of us are meeting today where are we situated in terms of history in terms of geography in terms of time and in our own personal terms if we understand this a little better i believe we will be able to understand other things also in a better fashion so i want to tell my young friends here today that they may have heard of bird hospitals i have no idea how many of you have ever had the good fortune of visiting a bird hospital but in the city of delhi there are many bird hospitals they take care of birds that are injured i have been to some of these hospitals and they do a commendable job what is it that drives this philosophy of taking care of birds i don't know how many of you are aware that india was the first country in the world to set up hospitals for birds and animals and do you know when we did that hundreds of years before the time of jesus christ samrat ashok emperor ashok was the first person in the world to use state resources to set up hospitals for birds and animals of course he did 
enormous stuff for the well-being of humans but ashok's compassion was for all living beings and he is one of those rare examples of an emperor who was undefeated and ruled almost all across india and who had converted to this life of generosity and compassion from a position of strength and there is much we can learn from those times from our history remember all that is embedded in our dna we have sprung from this soil of india and it is embedded in our dna and if we wish to recognize ourselves if we wish to understand our dna we must delve a little bit into the realm of history and see what made india what it was and let us learn some lessons so that in the context of today in our own personal journeys our paths will become a little clearer hopefully i will be able to give you a little bit of the story of india from this perspective and then we will see how we can relate it to present day context not just to inspire but to draw practical lessons i don't know how many of you have ever looked at the time of alexander we have been taught in history that alexander came to india after having conquered vast territories all across before he reached india he defeated the persian emperor darius and then he came into india from the northern route by land and he had some critical battles here one of his most important battles was with porus and he almost lost in that battle with porus they had never his army had never faced elephants before porus came and when they fought with porus the elephants proved very ferocious very strong before alexander's army as luck would have it porus's elephant was hurt badly and so he panicked and retreated and since porus was sitting on the elephant his army became confused and that is how alexander won with porus but porus's kingdom was a very small kingdom very small when he defeated porus he moved further inwards and then he came to the byas river which is in the punjab of today and history books written largely by western historians will not tell you that alexander did not cross the byas for a special reason he returned from the byas and our history books as we have studied them tell us that alexander's soldiers told him that they were tired and they wanted to go back and they were homesick and so alexander returned that is not the true story as history now tells us and there is lots of emerging evidence i am not speaking in thin air alexander's spies who had gone across the byas river came back and told him that the powerful magadan army was arrayed across the river in full strength and the magadan soldiers were waiting eagerly to give him battle the magadan empire was an undefeated and vast empire something like which alexander had never seen before his spies told him that there are more than 40000 elephants and even larger number of cavalry soldiers mounted on horses and infantry much larger and that is when alexander decided to return that was the might of india he never really dared to conquer india but he was disappointed when he was returning and you know he had made friends with porus so on his way back porus gifted him with a hundred talents of steel talent is like an ingot i do not know its exact measurement but these are blocks of steel he gave him hundred talents of the famous wood steel of india and that cheered up alexander now you should ask yourself this question why was alexander cheered up when he got the wood steel talents the ingots of the steel that was coming from india do you know you may have heard of the famous 
Damascene sword, the sword of Damascus. It was famous throughout the world for centuries because it was a special sword. It was sharp, it was true, it would not easily break and it matched all kinds of steel from other parts of the world and was better. That sword was made from steel from India, the famous Woods steel. This was a process of steel making that came from the metallurgical factories of India spread across a vast region. And India used to export this steel in huge quantities. There are records of Greek historians who write that all these exports that come to us from India that we are importing, they take away all our wealth. So here was a knowledge system. India had the knowledge to make a special kind of steel that nobody else knew how to make. And this monopoly of India lasted for centuries. So much so, I'm talking to you about the time of Alexander. I can tell you with complete conviction that the domination of the woods steel lasted up to the time of Michael Faraday in the early part of the 18th century. Michael Faraday, this great scientist, the greatest of his time and one of the greatest the world will ever know. He also tried to produce the woods steel, but he failed. Only India could do that because it had a special metallurgical process. Now, this was not an accident. It isn't that we were only good at making woods steel or building hospitals for birds or animals. To have the wisdom, to have the infrastructure, to have the ability and institutional might or the economic might, it does not happen through one or two accidents of history. The whole process that made up Indian society was based on deep and fundamental knowledge systems. I want you to understand that. The wood steel came out of a process which was a combination of physics, chemistry, metallurgy, and it allowed India to prosper because we could export this steel. And if you think the wood steel was being put to use only for making swords, you're badly mistaken. I do not know how many of you are aware. These are facts of history. I'm about to tell you something interesting. Did you know that India actually invented plastic surgery? And I did not learn this from any history book in India. I first came across this in a very well-known account of India's history written by a famous Russian historian called Alexander Nemirovsky. He talks about how great Indian physicians of the Ayurvedic science used to perform routinely plastic surgery. Then, of all the places, I found a book in the library of the famous Johns Hopkins University, which is well known for medicine in the whole world. Even today for the coronavirus, Johns Hopkins information knowledge holds sway over the world. People always visit the Johns Hopkins medical site to learn what is happening on coronavirus. And in the library of the Johns Hopkins University, there is a history of surgery written by a famous physician and historian of science in America. And he writes clearly that India not only invented plastic surgery, it also invented cataract surgery. And then in his book, he describes all these surgical instruments that India used to use hundreds of years before the time of Jesus Christ. All those instruments were made from the woods steel. They are extremely fine instruments. I have spoken to experts on Ayurvedic sciences in today's world in India. I have looked at the diagrams in that book from Johns Hopkins. Those instruments are thinner than the human hair. How could they build them? How could they make them? How could they craft those instruments? They could do that because our sciences, our knowledge systems were all around developed. It wasn't that we were only good at mathematics or only good at building bird hospitals. India was a knowledge society. India was a knowledge economy. All through the centuries, India's knowledge systems made its economy strong. You must understand this. You are young people. I want you to understand that without a good knowledge system, 
no country can prosper unless your economy is backed by strong knowledge systems you are not going to do well how was india prospering all this knowledge was being put to practical use i must tell you you are young learn to find applications and uses with your hands of the knowledge in your head combine the knowledge with practical ends and you will always find success look at the lives of all the great ones not just from india from across the world they were great because they had this insight that knowledge and skills go hand in hand you look at india's story first you know there is an account written by a famous economic historian angus madison who was a british historian he wrote a monumental treatise on the economic history of the world and he records that from the 1st century ad it is based on hard data from the 1st century ad till the beginnings of the 18th century india dominated global gdp china was a close second why did that happen because knowledge systems were driving india and i will quickly give you two or three examples i want you to put it in that context that knowledge is never to be put in isolation knowledge is never to be meant to be stored in a book or written on the blackboard or memorized only for an exam that is a very unfortunate aspect of knowledge systems in india humans by nature all of us across the world are entrepreneurial we have in our dna in our genes the entrepreneurial habit unfortunately in india our knowledge systems have somehow subdued our entrepreneurial spirit and given us a mindset of needlessly mindlessly thoughtlessly just memorizing knowledge put down on a blackboard or on a textbook so that we can succeed in some strange entrance examination or something like that it does not elevate us it does not help society and i'll tell you what i mean by that and i'll tell you why you must learn to have an entrepreneurial spirit inside you and i will tell you that with real world examples but that must be balanced with what is called your moral fiber you have a moral law inside you i cannot teach you that law it comes to you from your conscience and i will give you examples of that imbibe that law work hand in hand with that law and your entrepreneurial spirit and be innovative and do what you believe in and you will create your own milestones of success success is not to be measured by wealth not to be measured by fame not to be measured by power success is measured by personal satisfaction your conscience must tell you that you can rest easy wear those glorious medals that your conscience gives you inside your heart that tell you that you have led a good honest productive life that you have not harmed people that you have brought good around you that you have fulfilled that which your conscience your soul your antaratma told you and let me illustrate that with examples so let's go back to india story i mentioned to you the wood steel i mentioned to you plastic surgery cataract surgery but there were so many other things that india was doing much before the time of the greeks india invented geometry hundreds of years before the greeks the theorem of pythagoras is embedded in a very ancient text called the satpat brahman it is even older than the upanishads it's even older than the shulbha sutras and the shulbha sutras themselves which are hundreds of years before the time of the christ they are texts authored by indian mathematicians each shulbha sutra is authored by an individual mathematician and let me tell you they embody deep ideas of geometry coming from practical applications in the real world you know shulbha means a piece of cord or string sutra means formula or aphorism these are formulae aphorisms principles ideas discovered through the use of a piece of string and let me explain what that means if you were to take the time and have the curiosity 
you go to any construction site today in India or other parts of the world, you will find the mason, the bricklayer, he has a piece of string with a dead weight attached to it at one end. He's always using that for his measurements, for his alignments and so on. That is the shulva that I'm referring to in the title of the book, Shulva Sutra. These are formulae that come from the use of this string with a dead weight for various architectural constructions. What were these constructions? These were constructions being created by architectural mathematicians who were building special architecturally designed Vedic sites for Vedic rituals for fire sacrifices. This is when the Rig Ved was being practiced in India. Each special fire sacrifice, whether you wanted to win a battle, whether you wanted to have rain, whether you wanted to have a good harvest, whether you wanted good health, all of them required special fire sacrifices. For each sacrifice, you had to construct an elaborate fire altar, Yagya Vedi. Each of them were very complicated. If you look at the books by Bodhayan and others, and you look at the pictures of the fire altars, then you will get an idea of what I'm trying to tell you. They had to be constructed to precise requirements of area and geometry and shape. And that is how geometry grew in India. And the Shulva Sutra of Bodhayan has the statement of the theorem of Pythagoras hundreds of years before Pythagoras. It also has an algorithmic idea of the proof. This is India's great contribution. The use of the word algorithm. In the algorithm really comes from al Khwarizmi, who was an Arab mathematician who transmitted India's knowledge to Europe. And all the algorithmic methods that India had were put down by al Khwarizmi for Europeans. And the Europeans then therefore called those step-by-step -step methods algorithms. But they were really Indian. And they are there even in the Shulva Sutras and in other books also. And these are, this is one of India's greatest contributions, the algorithmic approach to mathematics. And that geometry was much, much, much before the time of Euclid and Pythagoras and the others. Incidentally, all of us read the theorem of Pythagoras by his name. Very few of us get to know that actually Bodhayan discovered it much before him. And there were others even before Bodhayan in India who knew the theorem. But leave that aside. I want to tell you something else. How much India was regarded in the Western world as a great knowledge center. Pythagoras came to India. You may ask me, how do I know that? Pythagoras' own pupil, Apollonius of Tyana, he writes in his book, this is the direct pupil of Pythagoras. I have read the book. And he writes clearly that my master went to India to learn from the Brahmans and the gymnosophists. As little as I've understood, the gymnosophists, I believe, were Jain monks. So Pythagoras came to India. He was there in around 500 BC. I went to Indore and I asked Indologists in Indore who work on these kinds of things if they felt that Pythagoras had come to India and they told me the same thing that Apollonius writes. They said, what is there to ask? We have known this always that he came here, that he was influenced by Jain philosophy. He became a vegetarian. He stopped wearing leather. He discarded most of his clothes, was to wear minimal clothes, used to eat before sunset. And this is written in Apollonius's book also. And then, a couple of centuries later, there is another Greek who writes, Apollius, in his Florida lectures. He writes over there that Pythagoras came to India and he writes many things. And both of them, Apollonius and Apollius, write that India was a huge economic power that used to export things that were not found in other parts of the world, including wood steel. And it was taking away a lot of wealth in terms of gold from these regions. So let me make it clear to you that the entrepreneurial spirit in India was combined with the knowledge spirit. Knowledge was put to use for the well-being of society. I don't know how many of you are aware, we are told in history that Vasco de Gama discovered the sea route to India. 
I don't know if you know that when Vasco da Gama decided to come to India, he picked up an Indian navigator in Africa. There were hundreds of them over there. Indian ships from hundreds of years before the time of Vasco da Gama used to go to Africa and beyond from India, crossing the Indian Ocean. This navigator's name was Kana. He picked him up there and Kana take, took him straight from the Cape of Good Hope straight to Kerala, across the Indian Ocean. Europeans didn't know how to do that. They did not know how to navigate the high seas. How could Kana do that? Because knowledge systems in India had created elaborate, sophisticated means of navigation in the high seas. So much so that Indian ships could sail across the high seas, indulge in trade and economic activity with far off lands, and come back without any loss. Compare this with hundreds of years of European sailing, and most of the time, the ships would get lost, get destroyed, because they didn't know how to navigate on the high seas. This was so important for Europe that the kings of Spain and even Britain, they set up huge prizes for anyone who could discover how to navigate at sea. They were unaware that in India, they were using a mathematical device called the Rappel Guide that allowed them to determine position at sea. All this was based on deep mathematics. India had discovered trigonometry. Trigonometry is a gift of India to the world. And it happened around just after the time of Christ that trigonometry began to develop in India. Again, for reasons of astronomy, for reasons of being able to navigate the high seas, we began to study planetary motion and we developed spherical trigonometry. All this is our contribution. So I want you to understand this, that the entrepreneurial spirit in India was strong and it was bound to knowledge systems. What are the lessons that we need to learn from there? The Mimansa School of Philosophy, an ancient school of philosophy in India says clearly that knowledge without action is meaningless. I urge you young minds, I know that in our schools, in our colleges, in our universities, we are always taught strange ways of learning through blackboard and textbook in theory. We are given very few opportunities and chances to do something practical. I don't know of any school teacher or student who has actually gone to the Samrat Yantra and Jantar Mantra to work out these simple mathematics based on which you can actually tell local time with great accuracy. They never do that. These are applications of the mathematics that is taught to you in your classroom. I don't know how many of you are ever given an opportunity in the classroom as part of your curriculum to be able to design a search engine based on simple mathematics and good programming. You can do that, I'm sure, but it will never be part of your curriculum. Why is knowledge that we are taught in our syllabus, whether it is CBSC or something else, why is that so removed from real world things? Knowledge is supposed to be put into action. It is not separate. And the Britishers and Western world gave us a strange system of treating physics as separate from chemistry and mathematics and chemistry as separate from biology and economics and this and that. And they compartmentalized knowledge 100 years ago, more than that. Our systems were not like that. And they have changed in the Western world. Go look at how they teach anything at Harvard or MIT or Imperial College. In the Department of Mathematics at Imperial College, which is ranked amongst the top five, six universities in the world, they offer eight, nine different degrees in mathematics so that you can choose what your heart tells you. And all of these degrees are connected with different disciplines in a practical way. Over here, if you are studying maths, you're not allowed to look at physics and chemistry in a creative way, in a natural, transdisciplinary, hands-on manner. I want you to think about this, not because I want to dishearten you. I want you to think about this so that even if you don't get opportunities inside your strange classroom environment, you can still enrich yourself. You can still empower yourself by your own efforts. And that's why I want to come to the second phase of my talk. 
यू मस्ट लर्न टू डिस्कवर योर सेल्फ अपने आप को पहचानिए अपने अंतर आत्मा की आवाज को समझिए इस अंतर ध्वनि को पकड़िए कैच दैट ड्रम बीट ऑफ योर सोल एंड हाउ विल यू कैच दैट यू विल हैव टू लुक फॉर एक्सटर्नल स्टिम्यूलाइ तेंदुलकर ड्रम बीट टेल्स हिम टू प्ले क्रिकेट दैट्स वॉट हैपन टू हिम वॉज वेरी यंग लेस देन टेन ईयर्स ऑफ एज and he had been exposed to many drum beats he was very fond of playing ping pong then suddenly he saw cricket and that struck a chord in him and he decided that this is his drum beat it didn't come to him in a classroom we still have university systems and school systems that feel that playing a sport is far far inferior and unfortunate as compared to studying mathematics or physics or biology which is unfortunate all of these are experiences in education education is that which allows you to discover your soul jo aapko avsar de andar jhakne ka apne aap ko pehchanne ka usi ko kehte hain shiksha prashikshit tabhi hote hain jab andar jhak ke apne aap ko pehchan le par hum to ye karte nahi hai koi farak nahi padta even tendulkar did not get a chance did he say therefore i am defeated and i am demoralized no tendulkar decided that he will stick to cricket no matter what happens because that resonates with his soul he did not say i will play cricket because then i will become famous i will become rich i will get the bharat ratna no all these things came to him of their own accord because he played cricket with complete dedication and sincerity find that in your life if you do that you will always become successful remember i told you at the beginning success is not about money power or fame believe me you are young right now you will not fully understand what i'm telling you success is that which makes you steady success is that which gives you inner satisfaction success is that which is dictated by your conscience success is that which has been done in harmony with the drum beat of your soul isko seekho isko samjho in baaton ne duniya ko rasta dikhaya hai aapko nahi malum hai mahatma gandhi ki bhi drum beat aise hi mili thi from an external stimulus in class 7 even before that i think he was 7 years of age actually when he saw this play satyavadi raja harish chandra and the play struck a chord in his soul dil ko chhu gaya when he came home that night he took a vow i will adhere to the truth no matter what the price no matter what the cost and his whole life it is never easy if you think tendulkar's life was easy after that if you think that mahatma gandhi's life was easy you are badly mistaken all of them have led very difficult lives but they were successful why not because they became famous not because they made money not because they were powerful no because they did what their heart told them and in consonance with their conscience in consonance with the moral law that is what you need to do and if you think about this and stay the course success will come to you let me tell you a true story let's leave the great ones aside right now i'll tell you a true story from almost little less than 100 years ago in america in the year 1932 when there was prohibition in america you may not believe this but in america in 1932 you were not allowed to have alcohol you it was completely illegal and this gave rise to a criminal world there were lots of crimes and the mafia grew in any case in the city of chicago a police officer was murdered by some criminal elements and a young man was arrested for this crime and imprisoned for life this happened in 32 14 years later in the chicago times there appeared a small advertisement very small which said a 5000 dollar reward is offered to anyone who can give any clues to the real killers of the detective who was murdered in 1932 in chicago this caught the attention of the editor of chicago times where the small advertisement had appeared so he asked his reporter to go and find out 
who had issued this ad and what was it all about. The reporter went looking for the person who had given that ad. Do you know who the person was? It was a frail old lady called Tilly. Tilly had given this ad. Who was Tilly? Tilly was a cleaning lady. She used to clean large buildings. She used to scrub the floors. The man who had been arrested and imprisoned for life for the murder of the detective was Frank, Tilly's son. And Tilly knew that her son was innocent, but because they were so poor, they could not organize a proper legal defense, and the son was wrongly imprisoned. Tilly had no money to fight for his defense by hiring a good lawyer. Did Tilly give up? No. For 14 years, six days a week, from morning to night, Tilly went about scrubbing floors, cleaning floors, building after building, 14 long years, and each day, whatever she earned, she saved the money. After 14 years, she had $5,000. It's not a big sum of money, but in those days, it was a reasonable sum of money. She felt this money is enough to offer as a reward to someone who may give a clue. And that's happened. The reporter met Tilly, heard the story, looked at the money, and he decided they could build a proper defense for Tilly's son. And they did that. And the real culprits were finally caught and Tilly's son was found to be not guilty and released. That is success. Tilly believed in this. She was not looking for power. She was not looking for anything great. No, she believed in something and she stayed the course 14 years and her son was released. Much happened after that, but that's a different story. There was a Hollywood movie that was made of that. Leave all that aside. The lesson we need to learn is once you believe in something, you have to stay the course. Dhire dhire re mana, dhire sab kuch hoi. Mali siche so ghada ritu ayatako. Yad rakho. Stay the course. You think Tendulkar, once he said at age 10, I want to play cricket, became an overnight sensation. You talk to him, you read what he has written. There were many ups and downs and many doubts in his life. But he never gave up. That is the story you must learn from Amitabh Bachchan's life. You know, Akshay Kumar says that they did one movie together. And he said that Amitabh Bachchan was so disciplined that he, this is after Amitabh Bachchan has become such a famous actor. He used to come to the studio even before the security guards used to come to unlock it. He was the first to come every day. And he said in his makeup room, he would memorize every dialogue 50 times. That is when you see him perform so well on the screen. We think that he comes, he walks, he talks, and he goes away. It's not easy. Why do you think he is so successful? If you look at the life of Muhammad Ali, the, one of the greatest boxers the world has known, his manager in the early days before he became a champion has told his story that he used to be the first to come to the gym and the last to leave. Practice day in, day out, practice. In the battle, when Arjun had taken this vow in the Mahabharat, that tomorrow I will kill Jayadrat or commit personal harakiri by self-immolation. When this news goes to Jayadrat, he is extremely disturbed. The night before the battle, he is so disturbed, he goes to Guru Dronacharya. And he asks him that, tell me, Guruji, you have taught me and Arjun both. Tell me honestly, who will win tomorrow? Do you know what Drone says to Jaitrat? Drone tells him that, you know, I taught you and Arjun equally. I taught you and Arjun the same things. But Arjun excels for two reasons. Because of his superior discipline, Arjun practices every day. You read Arjun's life, you read the Mahabharat in the original, and you will notice that Arjun was completely disciplined and dedicated to his skills as an archer. He said Arjun excels because of his superior discipline and because he has the truth on his side. Truth and hard work, they will make you successful. You will establish your own milestones because of these things. Those are the lessons I want you to imbibe. 
those are the things you must take. Here's one more lesson. Success, again, I keep telling you, does not come to us by fame, by power, by money. No. Again and again, your conscience should judge you as being a good man, having done a good thing, and don't tell the world about it. Go to sleep with an easy conscience and a light heart. And that is your measurement of success. Let me tell you again. You know, when the British were ruling India, we were in a bad shape. We had people, there were so many people who felt bad about it. They tried to throw the British out. We weren't having any great success. And then Mahatma Gandhi came along. That is the first time in India, one man managed to rouse the whole nation. There were so many great people, even before Gandhi and after Gandhi, all great. All of them had the same love, the same sacrifice, the same dedication for India. Unfortunately, they did not have the same success. What was Gandhi's success? That he could rouse the whole nation. And why could Gandhi do that? Because he connected to the masses. He kept his finger on the pulse of the masses. How did Gandhi do that? It didn't happen that one day Gandhi said, I'm going to be Gandhi. I will talk for the masses. No. Have you had a look at the struggles that went behind Gandhi's life before he became Gandhi? the kind of hard work, the kind of challenges, the kind of places where he had to face death all the time. You have to build your spirit and character through these exams, through these challenges to your own conscience, to your own well-being, to your own character. And you must see that you have come out successful. One of the great challenges that Gandhi faced, very few people know that. Just as we have the corona pandemic now in South Africa, in Johannesburg, the plague had struck badly. People had abandoned huge parts of the city. No one wanted to go there. The plague was highly infectious. There was no cure for the plague. And people who came into contact with patients would die because they would contract the plague themselves. In those difficult times, in such a difficult circumstance, Gandhi volunteered to go there and take care of the patients. And he said, I need people to help me. He asked for other volunteers. You know what he said? I make some conditions. Only those can come with me who do not have any other family. I only want those people. Here is this man who has four young children, four sons, a young wife. Gandhi is in his early 30s. And he goes there. He risks his life. But he doesn't allow others who have family to come with him. A British nurse, an English nurse comes with him. Some other people come with him. And they go there, they take care of all the sick. The British nurse contracts the plague and dies. That's the kind of risk Gandhi took. That is a profile in courage. Success sone ke liye, dileri chahiye, dedication chahiye. This is why he started becoming Gandhi. And that is not the only time he took this challenge. There are so many occasions when God, there were 14 attempts made on the life of Mahatma Gandhi. Once they tried to kill him with a grenade and the grenade, they threw the grenade on the wrong car. Once there was a knife attack on him, did Gandhi back off? No. These are ordeals and tests by fire. All of us go through that. Bhagat Singh went through that. Chandrasekhar Azad went through that. Ishwakullah went through that. All of them. Ram Prasad Bismil went through that. Ganesh Shankar Vidyarthi went through that. This is India. This is the lesson you must imbibe. This is how you will create your own milestones. But I once again urge you, never be disheartened by anything. Stay the course. Believe in yourself. Do not be overconfident. Use your hands. Connect to the needs and challenges of the world. There are many needs and challenges that my nation faces. Ask yourself and don't expect to have success in one day. Tilly scrubbed for 14 years. Mahatma Gandhi built his whole story over decade after decade. For 10 years, he walked from village to village fighting the evils of untouchability. He forgot the freedom movement. 10 years, he walked from village to village to village eradicating the evils of untouchability. That is how you make an impact. Do not want easy success. There's a saying in English, easy come, easy go. 
don't allow that to happen stay the course stay strong and have good beliefs and things will come to you you know what thomas jefferson the famous president of the united states says is one of the four great presidents the us has produced in its entire history he said that i've been a very lucky man in life the harder i have worked the luckier i have been so remember this stay the course work hard be truthful find the drum beat of your soul just as tendulkar gandhi amitabh bachchan all of them found their drum beat and remember this you must be curious about things you must learn about the lives of the great ones and there are so many lessons to learn i'm sure you've heard the name of gregor mendel he gave us the laws of genetics did he suddenly wake up one day and say oh here are the laws of genetics no my god mental was struggling to qualify as a school teacher and they kept failing him repeatedly in the school teachers qualifying exam did you know that did it dishearten mental no he just kept his work going and he grew generation after generation of the pea plants looked at their flowers looked at their patterns and because he knew mathematics so he was very good at botany and gardening and he was very good at mathematics and so he saw the patterns emerging and he could see the laws of inheritance the laws of genetics even today when we fight to create a vaccine for the corona virus it is coming from mendel's work which led us to the discovery of the dna and rna molecules and that is why the vaccines may be successful because they are based on those ideas see what leads to what so stay the course even after he had discovered the laws of genetics they failed him <laughs> they failed him in the school teachers qualifying exam this superb teacher who teaches the world the laws of genetics is not recognized as a school teacher he finally gave up <laughs> he finally gave up but he was a happy man not because he had become famous he did not become famous he was just happy that he had done what he believed in so you must stay like that and look at the lives of the great ones and you will see that there is something that each person has to teach you pick those ideas from their lives and i am sure as jefferson said finally luck will descend upon you you know the story of alexander fleming who won the nobel prize by discovering penicillin how did he discover penicillin alexander fleming didn't say one day i'm going to go discover penicillin no he had his own lab where he used to conduct experiments and one of his experiments had not worked out and he had used up lots of petri dishes you know the small round dishes where we put down certain chemicals and certain you know fungi and this and that and bacterial growth he had many of them and had used them all and so he decided that he had to conduct another experiment and he needed to clean those petri dishes so he took them all to the sink and he began to wash them one by one and while he was washing them he suddenly realized that the dishes where the bacterial growth had been there for which his experiment had been conducted all the bacterial growth seemed to have suffered and a new color had come onto the dishes and you know there are two lessons you must learn from this always use your own hands he wasn't using a lab attendant to get him to clean the dishes i have known some really great nobel prize winning life scientists i found that they are very particular about the labs they clean their labs themselves they some of the really other great discoveries the time here is too short in life sciences from people i have known have happened because they were particular and used their own hands in their labs they didn't leave it to students or lab attendants fleming was like that because he was cleaning those petri dishes himself he saw the change in color and the second lesson curiosity he became curious why has this happened took it under the microscope and he saw a fungus had developed that was killing the bacteria that fungus was giving rise to penicillin that was killing the bacteria it is one of the most powerful miracle drugs ever invented in the history of mankind penicillin the first antibiotic it led to the nobel prize for fleming cv raman was like that do you know that cv raman was working as a accountant in the accountant general's office during british times in calcutta 
From nine to five, he used to work. And before nine and after five, he had found a small room where he used to perform his own experiments in physics by building his own apparatus. The total money he spent over those years in building the apparatus, which led to the Nobel Prize, was 200 rupees. And did he neglect his work as an accountant general? Nowhere has he complained that I wasted my time in accounting or this and that. And his British boss has written his confidential report. The boss writes that this man is an exceedingly good accountant. We should never leave him. This is the time when Raman is actually on his way to discovering the Raman effect. Learn from that. These are the milestones that will inspire you. And I'm telling you again, maybe your system will not. Don't complain. I went through the same thing. Anita Ji went through the same thing. Dr. Amitabh Tripathi, whom I'm told is in this audience, he went through the same trouble. All of us go through the same system. Sometimes it demoralizes. Sometimes we find good teachers. They help us. But the thing is, no one will really help you unless you help yourselves. Read the lives of good people. See where they became great and how. Learn from that. Stay the course, be patient, use your hands, look at the needs and challenges of society and adhere to the moral law and you will find your own way. Be entrepreneurial all the time. Einstein, this great theoretician who invented general relativity, one of the greatest inventions the history of mankind will ever know. He was so entrepreneurial. He invented the world's first modern refrigerator. Did you know that? He invented the first modern safe refrigerator, which could not lead to an explosion. He invented the world's first automatic camera. He held the patent for it. Money came to him from there. He didn't do it for money. He was just curious and he was entrepreneurial. And he also discovered general relativity, this great theoretical tool. So I'm telling you, and Einstein never got any help from anyone. He never complained. He just did it because he loved doing that. Those are the milestones you should look for. That is the lesson I wanted to tell you. This is how India was in the past. That is why we were so successful as a knowledge economy, as a great country. And I am very confident that you, the young minds, have the same genes inside you. You will also rediscover yourselves and through that, rediscover the greatness of India. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. But our uh, students, they have lots of curiosity when they come to know that uh, you will be joining us for today's talk. I received more than 200 questions from oh. different schools. <laughs> so uh, we cannot take, of course, uh, all of them, but few of them uh, we would like to take. So I am now inviting uh, Deepika Batra from our school. She will be moderating the session and we will take few questions. Whenever you feel that uh, now we shall stop. Please give us the cue. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. And I think the way you have covered the topic, the way you have encouraged the young minds, uh, it's, it's only you you can do. Because whenever I heard you, it's mesmerizing, it's encouraging. <laughs> And we have so Thank many you. young minds to ask so many queries. And first of all, we have Anushka Bansal from SD Public School, Pitampura. Hello. Anushka. Good morning, sir. I'm Anushka from SCPS. Good morning. I wish to ask that, what were the factors in your life that helped you to maintain your love and dedication for mathematics for so long? You know, I was very lucky. I was actually considered very poor in mathematics by my school teachers till the seventh grade. Uh, in the seventh grade, if I remember correctly, I scored one out of 100 in mathematics. So I don't think my teachers had a very high opinion of me. But in the eighth grade, my older brother, who was five years older than me and very smart, he gave me one 20, 30 minute lesson on the power of mathematics. Algebra and geometry, he combined the two. And suddenly a new world opened. It opened up my heart. It went straight inside my heart. And that is the evening. I remember this. It was late evening. I was walking by his room at home. He was at his desk. His table lamp was on. The, the scene is embedded in my mind. And I don't know why. He said, come here, Dinesh. I want to show you something. And he asked me, have you done this in school? I said, yes. I'm not sure what it is. He 
said, well, let me explain something about it. And he showed me how algebra could be combined with geometry. And that is the evening I became a mathematician. I mean, after that, I had to, you know, make a lot of effort, struggle a great deal, learn so much, enjoy mathematics. But that is my journey. The day that day, my journey started. Thank you, sir. That's really great. Thank you, sir. And the second we have Swati Sharma from Himalaya Public School. A very yes, yes, ma'am. Yep. Can I ask a question? Uh, very good morning, sir. And one and all present in this meeting. I want to ask, sir, that being extremely successful in professional life doesn't ensure a good personal life. Is it right to just focus on IQ and neglecting EQ? Uh, I, I think you should neither focus on IQ beta nor on EQ. Mm -hmm. Just focus on yourself. Just focus on yourself in a holistic way. Don't worry about these newfangled concepts of EQ and IQ. Remember, follow the moral law. You know, Gandhi used to say repeatedly, I have this tyrant inside me that is forever dictating me, telling me what to do. You know, you listen to that. And if you listen to that, and if you discover what your heart is telling you, what the drumbeat of your soul tells you, you will find a good balance will emerge between your personal and professional life. And remember, life is never easy. It was not easy for Gandhi. He had to balance his personal life and the life of, of a leader. And he was trying to evolve as a human being. And he managed. It took a long time. Nothing happens in the snap of a finger. No. It takes effort. And you have to make that effort but eventually, success comes. They develop equal points. Sir, uh, mathematics ke problem solve karna to hume hamesha se sikhaya gaya hai. But nobody told us how to tackle the problems in our real life, in the real context. What about them? Bina, I wish I could give you a magic bullet answer which says, here is how you tackle the problems of life. Each one of us faces problems all the time. Sometimes we face huge ordeals by fire. Sometimes these are easier. You have to learn from the lives of great ones, learn from the lives of your elders, read some books. Particularly if you read life stories of great people, you will learn many lessons. And one of the lessons will be how to tackle problems in life by looking at how they tackle the problem. And remember, life will always create trouble for you. I don't know of any great person who said my life has been complete smooth sailing and I've always been happy and lucky and I've been, you know, well, it doesn't happen like that. The important thing is that you know that you can face these troubles. That is what is important. Make yourself strong so that you have the strength to handle things. The things will always happen. That's what you will learn from the lives of the great ones. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And next we have Khushi Aroda from Maxford School. Good morning, sir. My question to you is that, do you think standardized testing is the most effective way to judge learning? Sorry, could you repeat the question? There was some voice uh, disturbance here. So my question to you is that, do you think standardized testing is the most effective way to judge learning? Sanitized testing, I, I don't Standard, know. Sir, sir, I'll repeat. Do you think standardized testing is the most oh, effective oh, way oh, to judge oh, the learning? Okay, good, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, no, that's a very good question. It's a good question. Believe me, <laughs> I, I have very little faith in the kind of testing we indulge in, in India particularly, but even in other parts of the world. You know, a test should not be about evaluating a person and by showing how good or bad he is. A test should be to enable the person. Our tests are designed to disable the person. We set our question papers in such a way that make sure that the person can't answer. We ne I have never seen a question paper where the question says, write what you know, write what you like. It never comes. We are never given a chance. Maybe there's some part of physics I didn't like and didn't study. There's some other part that I'm really good at. Am I ever given a chance to explain that? No. I will decide what you need to know. I don't believe in that kind of testing. This is too short a time. But I want to, if sometime if Anita ever decides to invite me again, I want to speak only about evaluation and testing and how bad it is in India. Okay, sir. Thank you. 
Sir, next we have Yashika Jindal from SD Public School, Pitampura. Good morning, sir. Hi. So my question to you is, which of the experiences is more close to your heart, learning mathematics as a kid or imparting the knowledge of your favorite subject with students in such renowned institutions? Uh, <laughs> again, that's a very interesting question. It's very difficult to separate the two. Let me tell you why I'm telling you this. I am not claiming to be a great mathematician or a good mathematician, but I'm certainly a happy mathematician. Okay? I enjoy mathematics. One of my very important discoveries, and it's really important not, not to the world, but to me, and it's the world has also liked it. It has been very highly cited. It's a very highly cited discovery of mine. You know how it happened? I was struggling with the solution to a problem that had been bothering me for a long time. At the same time, I had to fulfill my duties as a teacher. So I was teaching this class. And one day in the class, when I was trying to solve a particular problem, I looked at the problem and in trying to solve the problem, I devised a method. And while I was devising the method, it suddenly struck me that this method will work for the research problem that I'm struggling with. And I went home that day and sat down and verified and it worked, the idea worked. So, you know, you can't separate fulfillment I really believe that teaching and discovering mathematics, they go hand in hand. I really believe that. So they both make me happy. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, you always taught us this thing. Whatever you do, do it with full happiness and enjoyment. Then only you, you'll be the happiest person. And now next we have Piyush Kapil from SD Public School, Pitampura. Piyush. Hi, sir. Yush, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, sir. Hi. Good afternoon, sir. Hi. Uh, sir, it's always inspiring. Sir, your words are always inspiring. Thank and you. My question to you is, what was your mindset while uh, heading towards Imperial College? What was my... Sir, what mindset. was your mindset while heading towards Imperial College? Oh, okay. So, I was homesick. <laughs> Vikas, is that your name? Piyush, 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 Piyush. 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 I had never left my home earlier to go abroad. This was my first trip abroad. And when I landed there, my first day at Imperial College, I told myself I'm going back. So <laughs> my, my parents had given me enough money to buy a ticket. Not that they had said, use it for your ticket. They said, keep the money. As soon as you land, you will have expenses. And I checked the airfare and I realized it's enough to buy a return ticket. So I called up my parents and I said, I'm coming back. Oh. And my mother got on the phone and said, if you come back, I will never speak to you for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, so then I changed my mind. So my first experience was very unhappy. I was homesick. I was missing home like anything. I was missing India. But then, you know, once you start doing mathematics, things settle down. And I enjoyed it. Yes, it was very enjoyable. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sang, next, we have Harsh Yadav from SD Public School, Pitampura. Harsh Yadav. Good morning, sir. Morning. Sir, my question is that have you ever gone through a situation in your life where you have to make a decision which can change your entire life? Oh, well, many times, many times. I, you know, when I finished my PhD at Imperial College, my professor did not want me to return back. He tried to, you know, tempt me to stay, but I had decided I will go back, not to become a teacher or join a university. I wanted to go live in an ashram in Rishikesh. I had made up my mind that I'm going to go and live there. And I was hoping that the ashram will allow me. I'll do some work for the ashram. In return, I should have a room by the river, Gangaji, and I will be allowed to do mathematics in peace. That's all I wanted to do, do mathematics. I had no idea how I will earn my food. And I wrote to my father that I'm going to do that. I, I, I'm going to go live in this ashram. But, you know, suddenly my college, St. Stephen's College, where I had been a student before I went to Imperial, I received a letter from the college that I've been appointed in absentia as a lecturer at, at St. Stephen's College. 
now they are called assistant professors even then i didn't want to go back but he had written in the letter that they're going to give me very you know excellent furnished living facilities and a valet a personal valet a kind of butler or attendant who will serve breakfast in bed that looked a little interesting for me i still didn't want to come back i wanted to go to the ashram but my english friends they persuaded me take the job for one year and we will come and stay with you when we visit india we'll enjoy the valet have breakfast in bed and after one year you can resign and go live in the ashram and some friends kept persuading me some of them are famous people in india now and so eventually i said okay let me try this for one year and that changed my life completely <laughs> i i went into a different stream altogether i gave up the ashram idea so that was my life changing decision <laughs> thank you sir the next we have tanish kumar kaushal for himal from himalaya public school yes tanish you can ask morning, your question morning sir so much tanish sir don't you feel like tanish yes, can you what uh, don't you think our education system is making rents to what traditional side wants from them at the what they from themselves Tanish, your voice is breaking. I'm sorry. I'm Tanish, not able... can you repeat your question? Sure, I'm sure. The undeflag or education system is make students do what traditional society wants them, rather than what they want from themselves. Yes, of course. I think what you're trying to tell me is the education system forces students to do what society wants from them. Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. That is what it is. So you know, Tanish, yeah, that is one of the tragedies. But you don't have to follow that. A student, I'm not saying you should rebel. Sometimes there is enormous parental pressure on us that we should sit for IIT entrance or we should sit for a medical entrance. I have always tried to tell parents: success will not come through something that you think is successful. Success will come when your child is allowed to pursue. what his heart is telling him he has to listen to his heart he has to listen to the drum beat of his soul not easy and good things never come to you easy in english as they say easy come easy go koi cheez agar saralta se mil jayegi to usi saralta se wo chali bhi jayegi so don't look for this immediate success his parents make this mistake they have this feeling bacche ko iit mein ghusa diya engineering ki degree dila diya ab life ban jayegi i met so many students who are graduates of iit who are so unhappy and so many who are studying in the iits who are unhappy and i met so many students who are taking a degree in this or that they are less unhappy because they are doing things that they believe in that they like and i have come across countless such stories i have known people who have become what they really wanted to become through a path they chose for themselves and they believed in it not easy there will be doubts your parents your friends will tell you ye kya kar rahe ho phans jaoge raste mein bhatak jaoge gambhirta se sochte hain phir lambi race khelte hain to safalta milti yes thank you oh, sir thank you sir thank you for having my question thank you and next we have nana dengi from sd public school pitampura nana very good morning sir i am nana dengi from sd public school and i would like to ask that what was the source of inspiration for you to become a great personality that you are today oh first of all let me make it clear i'm not a great personality and and if you don't believe me you, you are not actually, okay we, <laughs> we are learning a lot from you sir okay that's very kind of that's a very good example very very kind of you but i i'm not great believe me i'm not trying to be modest but yes i enjoy talking to young minds i enjoy talking to students and i enjoy doing mathematics the the fortunate thing for me was that i managed to find something that i like at a very young age as, as i said i entered the 8th grade and i realized this is what i want to do mathematics it really worked for me but life is never easy i also realized that reading the biographies and autobiographies of good great people they help you 
I looked at the life of Sri Nivas Ramadhan. I looked at the life of Mahatma Gandhi. I looked at the life of Bhagat Singh. I looked at the life of Isaac Newton, of Albert Einstein. And you know, you learn many things. You know, the amount of struggle they had to face. Einstein, after he had made three great discoveries, special relativity, Brownian motion, quantum theory of life. At that time, he couldn't find a job in physics. He was working as a patent clerk, third class, in the patent office in Bern. And this is when, as a patent clerk, just like C.V. Raman, who was working as an accountant, he made those great discoveries. Then he applied for promotion to patent clerk, second class, and they failed him. See that? So life was not easy for Einstein. But you will find he has never complained about those days. He looked back as his, on his days as a patent clerk with some fondness, with some satisfaction. Similarly with C.V. Raman, he worked as an accountant. He never complained about it. And he did his work as a physicist. Separate from that, both places he did well. So that is the thing that helps you when you look at the life of the great people and you realize life is always something like a struggle. Your challenge is to overcome that struggle, the challenges that the struggle brings. And with that, some satisfaction will come to you. That is what makes you happy and contented. And, you know, there will always be ups and downs. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you for enriching our knowledge. Thank you. You have shared very great examples which we were not familiar of. Thank you. Again, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Suryanshi Chadda from Mamta Modern Senior Secondary School. Suryanshi Chadda. Okay, so next we have Ayushi Agarwal from Himalaya Public Senior Secondary School. Uh, good morning, sir. Hi. Uh, sir, this question is in context to a very specific incident that was narrated by you at a TEDx speech at Ramanujan College in the year 2017. Wow. Where you, where you mentioned about Kasturba Gandhi's role in Mahatma Gandhi's life. So, so my question to you is, how much do you think ideals and companions are important in one's life? Oh, you know, you know it's a very, very good question. And it can only come from a lady. <laughs> Boys and men, they don't, they can't think of these things. You know, Gandhi used to say his whole life that he learned the lessons of non-violence from Kasturba. Did you know that? Yes, and sir. He was not trying to win any votes. He was not trying to seek an election. He was not trying to please the feminists. Gandhi always spoke from the heart. He spoke the truth. And it isn't that Bar told him one day, come on. You know, Kasturba was a little older than Gandhi. They were born the same year. This is also the 150th birth year of Kasturba. She was a little older than Gandhi. She used to call him Moenia. But she didn't say, come Moenia, I will teach you non-violence. No. The way Ba lived her life, Gandhi saw that there was non-violence embedded in her personal daily actions. And he learned his lessons from there. And they, wives, but I don't know about men. You know, at least I know that I don't think I've made any difference to my wife. But my wife has made me a better human being. I know this. I know this for a fact. I'm a better human being because of my wife. And even my mother had a huge influence on me. When I was three years old, she told me the story of Jesus Christ, the story of Bhagwan Buddha, the story of Bhagwan Mahavir. They had profound impact on me. And uh, I think women bring a special dimension to human existence. Do you know that when Jesus Christ was being tried by his Roman rulers in Jerusalem, Pontius Pilate was the governor, the Roman governor. He was going to try Christ at a public trial. In the morning before the trial, Pilate's wife, this Roman governor, his wife told him in the morning, don't do that. She understood the divinity of Christ. But the Roman men, they pandered to the population over there who wanted Christ to be crucified and therefore they crucified him. And you know how Christianity went to Europe? Through the Roman women. So there is something that God has given to women that we men don't have. And for therefore, when we men get companions, 
then life becomes much better for us. But I don't know if it is true the other way around. I have no idea. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we have Suryanshi from Mamta Modern School. She's raising the hand. Can you please unmute? Uh, I would request the host to unmute her. Suryanshi, now she's, uh, she's unmuted. Suryanshi, you can ask your question. Suryanshi, can you hear me? Okay, now uh, we'll move to the next. Next, we have Ishita Gupta from SD Public School, Pitampura. Good morning, sir. My question is to you is, what was your turning point in your life which took you towards success being a mathematician? Oh, I don't know about success as a mathematician. I have never really looked at that very seriously, particularly now. Yeah, if you're judging success by means of how happy I am being a mathematician? Yes, then, then I'm successful. Yeah, I'm happy being a mathematician. I like doing mathematics. And as I said a little while earlier, my happiness journey started with mathematics in the eighth grade when my elder brother introduced me to some very beautiful things in mathematics. And I don't know about anything else. What was the other part better about your question? What was it? Savage took you towards success being a mathematician. Ah, okay, so, so that's it. I enjoyed doing what I was doing. And if you think, I, when I got the job at St. Stephen's, even when I hadn't applied for it, if that is success, then that's because I believe I was doing something that I liked and I did it in a good way. Therefore, they decided, let's have this man here. And so, fine. If that is success, then that's how it happened. But I, I really don't know what else you could call success except that it gives you happiness. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, till now, I have, what I have learned from sir is success means happiness and happiness is the key to success. Happiness yeah. is the most important thing. So, now we next we have Veena Goel from SBM Rajori Garden. Veena Goel from SBM Rajori Garden. Okay. So now, let's let's we let's move to the next. Next we have Shubham Solanki from Maxford School. Shubham very Solanki. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, hi, Shubham. First of all, I would like to thank you for all the information and the facts you shared with us and the knowledge. Thank you. Uh, so my question to you is that when it comes to choosing a profession, a career option. What should we follow, our passion or the one which would make us more money? <laughs> you know, if you follow your heart and you do it with sincerity, it will not be important to have, have money. Happiness does not, satisfaction does not come from money. I'm not saying that therefore you should live on the road like a, you know, an urchin and beg for money. No, I don't mean that. But if you are reasonably good at what you like, then generally things happen which take care of you. There will be a struggle in the beginning. And there is a compromise you can make, like C.V. Raman did. You know, he, his heart was in physics, but he had to earn a living. Gandhi, I mean, um, uh, Einstein's heart was in physics, but he had to earn a living. So to earn a living, Einstein became a patent clerk and C.V. Raman became an accountant. Mendel became a school teacher, tried to become a school teacher. So all of them made some compromises, but they did not give up the real passion, physics or you know laws of genetics or stuff like that. And that's where your success will come from by doing that, which is striking a chord and which brings out your real passion, your real dedication, your real curiosity. And yes, Many times when you do this, like Tendulkar or Amitabh Bachchan, then money also comes. But never do it for money. Never. That's my humble advice. Never do it for money. But sir, uh, like when we are living in a country like India, uh, where society tells us that if you follow your passion or uh, you will just see happiness, then happiness is not going to you know, uh, satisfy your hunger. It won't get you your bread and butter. 
I don't know who tells you this. I have no idea. And what people tell you, what they, you have to find out what you believe in, you in your own mind. And I know so many people who followed their passion. They have been happy and successful. M. F. Hussain, the famous painter, is he had to earn a living, so he became a signboard painter. That's how he started. So signboard painting gave him enough for his food. And he continued his real painting and he became famous and then his paintings used to sell for crores of rupees. Same thing with C.V. Raman as I told you. Even Ramanujan, he struggled like anything in his early life. Eventually he became famous and the British gave him a huge salary. When the salary came, he said, I don't want it. He gave it away to poor students. Follow? So you have to stay the course. We are looking for instant success and all these people who you know, don't follow the heart and then they say, I'll take this degree, then I'll do an MBA, then I'll become this and that. Yeah, they get reasonable salaries, but they lead, many times they don't lead very happy lives. That's what I've noticed. Of course, I mean, there is no hard and fast rule. There will be lots of people in the corporate world who are happy. They'll tell you, I'm happy also and I'm making money. God bless them. So, sir, what we can say is like we can't compromise uh, happiness for money and money for happiness. Yeah, I mean, there's no contradiction or conflict between the two. It's not like that. I mean, I became a mathematician. I didn't know that I will become vice chancellor or I will get a Padma Shri or I will become a professor abroad in some of the best universities in the world. I never thought of all that. I just wanted to do mathematics. And the other things happen to you as bonuses along your journey. But I didn't do those things because I wanted to get the other things. No. Don't do that. Okay? Believe in something and follow that. But yes, I'm not saying become reckless and destroy your life. As I said, C.V. Raman compromised. He worked as an accountant. Einstein did that. Mendel did that. Even Ramanujan worked as a clerk to earn enough money. All of them did. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have Sanya Goyal from Maxford School, Rohini. Good morning, sir. Yes. My question for you is, do you think uh, the current way we are being educated fully prepares us for the needs of 21st century? Uh, so, you know, I studied in the 20th century. You know that, right? Yes. And uh, I'm still you know, able to handle all the challenges of the 21st century. So never worry about that. You know, what you study is not ever going to be enough. You spend your whole life studying and it will never be enough. The important thing is to pick up good things and good value systems and good, you know, skills and a little bit of knowledge and you will handle yourself well in life and you learn as you go along. Okay. Yes. Have you heard of Ram Krishna Paramans? Have you heard of him? I no? don't think so. Okay, so no, heard of Swami Vivekananda? No. Swami Vivekananda, you must have heard of. You heard of yes. Swami Vivekananda, beta? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, so he was the guru of Swami Vivekananda, Ram Krishna Paramhans. Gandhiji used to say that Ram Krishna Paramhans was a living God. You get the idea? Yes, sir. And you know what the living God said about himself? That so long as I live, I learn. Get my point? Yes, sir. You have to keep learning. If you think you have learned now and you can handle the 21st century, badly mistaken. You have to keep learning. Okay? Okay, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, sir. Next, we have Gaurav Gupta from Mamta Modern Senior Secondary School. Gaurav Good Gupta. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, Gaurav. Uh, myself, Gaurav Gupta from Mamta Modern Senior Secondary School, Class 11. Gaurav, Gaurav, Gaurav. Ek baat batao, beta. You are the first child I've seen who's wearing a tie. Wow. Thank you, sir. Very good. Yes. My okay. question to you is how to control overthinking? Overthinking? Yes, sir. I don't know what that means. <laughs> what, what is overthinking? Tell me. That sometimes we think... Uh, दीवानापन दिखाता है उसमें उलझ के खो जाता है फिर 
थोड़े जब इतनी तपस्या होती है ना इसको तपस्या कहते हैं तो थोड़े देर के लिए उसको छोड़ देते हैं सोचना अपने आप अब फिर दोबारा सोचोगे तो अपने आप फिर अच्छी बातें आने लगती है तो ओवर थिंकिंग उस प्रकार से करते हो तो बुरा नहीं है अब आप ओवर थिंकिंग को हाइपर एक्टिविटी ऑफ द माइंड कह रहे हो तो वो बुरी चीज है हाइपर एक्टिविटी होती का जो थोड़ा टीवी देख लो फिर फिल्म देखते हैं फिर बाहर चलते हैं फिर आइसक्रीम खाते हैं फिर जो है उसके साथ दौड़ते हैं फिर थोड़ा ये करते हैं फिर वो कर, वो नहीं दैट इज बैड हाइपर एक्टिविटी यू हैव टू स्टिक विद समथिंग दैट रेजोनेट्स इनसाइड यू उसको लेकर उलझ जाओ उसमें समा जाओ उसमें खो जाओ उसको लेकर दीवाना बन जाओ तो भला होगा ओके थैंक यू सर Thank you, sir. Next, we have Kanak Sharma from SD Public School, Pitampura. Kanak Sharma. Hi, Kanak. Kanak, can you hear us? Um, okay. Now we are moving next to Puneet Kathuria from Himalaya Public Senior Secondary School. Very good afternoon, sir. So my question to you is that: Do you think that the current educational system is turning the students with little profound knowledge uh, vulnerable to socio-political manipulation? Oh my God! This is a very profound question. I, 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 I really don't know. i am not happy with what the, our curriculum prescribes and i don't like the pedagogy that goes with it i think we are overdoing things we teach too much we don't leave room for the child to think and to experiment and to use his or her hands that should happen so we should teach a little less but the world does not listen to me okay <laughs> world listens to the iit entrance exam <laughs> the iit entrance exam and other entrance exams have killed education in india they've killed it yes sir that's my opinion it's a personal thank opinion thank you so much sir thank you sir next we have riya pande from saraswati bal mandir senior secondary school good morning sir so my okay. question is hello yeah go on So my question is: During this COVID-19 period, how much time we should spend in studies, and also how should we balance between the mental health and physical health? Ah, uh, okay. Now that's a very, very difficult question. For each person, there is a different. There's nothing like a fixed time. Do that which gives you basic inner balance. Thoda padhai ke liye, thoda man ko pehla ye. You must always take a little exercise. बहुत बहुत ज्यादा मिलियन मत लोगों से जितना हो सके अवॉइड कीजिए आई नो ऑल ऑफ अस आर ह्यूमंस वी लव टू मीट पीपल पर्सन पर थोड़े दिन के लिए नियम और संयम से रहिए तो भला होगा सो डोंट डू दैट थोड़ा पढ़िए जितना मन करता है उतना पढ़ाई कीजिए और फिर जब मन थोड़ा थक जाता है तो दोस्तों से बात कर लीजिए कभी कोई अच्छी किताब पढ़ लीजिए थोड़ा टीवी देख लीजिए अगर आपके घर पे आस खुली जगह है और बहुत भीड़ नहीं है लोग आसपास नहीं है तो थोड़ा वहां सुबह हैव यू ट्राइड गेटिंग अप यू गेट अप अर्ली इन द मॉर्निंग बेटा यस सर ओके हाउ अर्ली डू यू गेट अप यू डोंट हैव टू आस्क द क्वेश्चन एट 5:00 o'clock ओह वेरी गुड इन दैट केस कैन यू सी द सन राइज इन द मॉर्निंग फ्रॉम योर हाउस सर यस बिकॉज़ आई एम इन होम टाउन ओह वेरी गुड सो आप सुबह सूरज उगते सूरज को देखिए मन को बहुत बहुत हर्ष मिलेगा यू विल रियली एंजॉय द राइजिंग सन इन द मॉर्निंग और अगर इफ यू आर इन अ स्मॉल टाउन तो आपके यहाँ स्काई पोल्यूटेड नहीं होगा इज दैट राइट नो सर यस सर तो रात को कैन यू सी द स्टार्स एट नाइट यस सर ओके कैन यू सी द मिल्की वे यस सर ओके दैट्स वेरी गुड बिकॉज इन डेली यू कैन सी एनी So, उसको एंजॉय कीजिए मन बहुत खुश होगा हैव यू ट्राइड टू अंडरस्टैंड द यूनिवर्स अराउंड अस डू यू नो दैट दिस इज एन एक्सपेंडिंग यूनिवर्स आर यू अवेयर ऑफ दिस यस एवरीथिंग इन द यूनिवर्स इज मूविंग अवे फ्रॉम एवरीथिंग कैन यू इमेजिन दैट 
Yes, sir. If you are aware that everything, all the stars are moving away from each other. Yes, sir. Good. So, usko thoda dekhiye aur usko dekkar, you know, you should enjoy the splendor of nature around you. You listen to the birds in, uh, near your house. Yes, sir. And sir, every day, even. And you recognize the calls of every bird. Sir, sometimes not every day, but yeah, sometimes. Try and do that. Try to identify the birds by their calls. Right now, you will find many birds are building nests. This is the season for them to build nests. Are you aware of that? Yes, sir. So can yes, you start some nests? Aap unka video banaye, and you will find many interesting things around you. So keep your mind healthily occupied, and you'll you'll be happy. You'll enjoy this lockdown. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you so much, sir, for answering so many questions. I think if we will continue, it will go on and on. Okay. Uh, because there is uh, there there are limitless questions, and I am getting more questions on the Facebook Live. This uh, event is going on, so people are asking there also. I think we need to arrange one more session with you. Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. क्योंकि बच्चों का शायद दिल अभी नहीं भरा है और ये लॉकडाउन के समय में हमने ये शुरू ही इसलिए किया कि बच्चों को बातचीत करने के लिए अगर ऐसे लोगों से बातचीत करके प्रेरणा मिलती है और उनको समझ में आता है कि इस समय पे उन्हें कैसे अपना मेंटल और फिजिकल वेलबींग बैलेंस करके रखना चाहिए तो मुझे लगता है ये उनके लिए बहुत अच्छा होगा मैं सारे स्टूडेंट्स को एक बार ये कहना चाहूंगी कि मैं छोटे छोटे लेसन सर ने मैथमेटिक्स तो मुझे पढ़ाया है लेकिन लाइफ के बहुत सारे इम्पोर्टेंट लेसन भी मैंने सर से सीखे हैं वेन आई ज्वाइन एज ए प्रिंसिपल इन द स्कूल आई वेंट टू मीट सर एट दैट टाइम इन सेंट स्टीफन्स कॉलेज एंड एंड आई ऑब्जर्व सम सिंपल थिंग्स द वे ही वॉज टॉकिंग टू द गार्डनर देयर द वे ही वॉज टॉकिंग टू द अदर सपोर्टिंग स्टाफ मेंबर्स Uh, that immediately helped me to understand that what kind of relation building should be there uh, when you are working at any place with your colleagues and uh, whatever be their uh, designations their profiles are but you should be equally respectable to all and the second important lesson which he gave me when i struggled in my initial days to understand this new kind of administrative work one day i told him that uh, i don't want to continue with this teaching is the best thing and he he said that uh, it is your duty to struggle because uh, in this country there is the country is not doing well because of one mahatma gandhi everybody has to take the lead and every, every everyone learn to fight his own battle so uh, i think that's the most important lesson which i got in my life and that always help me lots of you have asked questions about the decision making the turning points uh, this one lesson can always help you to listen to your inner voice and to take right decisions um, now i hand over to mr ajay marwa um, uh, for uh, presenting the formal vote of thanks but before i end up sir i just want to read one couplet for you and uh, this is dedicated to all teachers uh, because in this pandemic time all the teachers they have shown a commitment and passion towards their profession abhi aapne kaha tha ki main 20th sadi mein padha tha lekin ye 21st sadi hai to mujhe koi problem nahi hui isko samajhne mein because learning continued तो सब टीचर्स ने इस बार जिस तरह से ट्रेडिशनल टीचिंग को छोड़ करके टेक्नोलॉजी को एम्ब्रेस किया है दैट वाज अमेजिंग और मुझे ये स्टूडेंट से ही सुनने के लिए मिला उन्होंने कहा कि टीचर्स एक्चुअल कर्मयोगी हैं और हम अपनी लाइफ के सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट लेसन उनसे सीख रहे हैं कि वो किसी भी एज में है उन्होंने इमीजिएटली अपने आप को चेंज कर लिया बदल लिया और नई टेक्नोलॉजी के साथ चल पड़े हैं सो द स्मॉल कपलेट dedicated to you and to all teachers saath samudra ki masi karu lekhani sab ban rahe sab dharti kagad karu guru 
गुण लिखा न जाए तो मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि वेदर वेदर वी ट्राई टू राइट सेवरल बुक्स इन प्रेज ऑफ आर टीचर्स इट विल नेवर बी कंप्लीट एंड वी कैन नेवर फॉरगेट व्हाट वी हैव लर्न फ्रॉम देम इन आर लाइफ नाउ आई हैंड ओवर टू मिस्टर अजय मिस्टर अजय कैन यू हियर मी यस यस एम आई ऑडिबल नाउ यस ओके सर a uh, very good afternoon to you sir and uh, it is a very happy uh, moment for us to listen to you to see you alive and god bless you with good health so that uh, the knowledge and the words of wisdom keep on showering on us uh, it's been uh, uh, six seven times i have been listening you and i have been uh, taking words and uh, motivations from your uh, uh, thoughts so today uh, was the soul shaking ultimate and life changing experience to be the part of your audience and listening to the words of wisdom sir you spoke on bharat being first on earth to establish health care for animals something we need to be pride and gain confidence i believe now is the time that lost pride be rediscovered and now is the uh, time when nature has given us chance to introspect and rediscover india and indians the indian treasure of knowledge economy medicine astronomy mathematics which is lost in the history is certainly required to be looked into for we teachers and students uh, sir you spoke eye opening words knowledge without action and we believe that uh, certainly it needs a change for us to grow as a confident nation i am humbled and honored to present gratitude on behalf of sdps family to uh, dr dinesh singh ji we the sdps family of teacher students and math department are, are highly obliged that you uh, spared precious time from your busy schedule and showered on us the words of wisdom uh, we are also thankful to asgs dream big welfare to organize such a wonderful webinar Finally we are thankful to the principal SDPS Mrs Anita Sharma to provide opportunity to teachers and students to listen to such a great speaker about India and uh, its real pride uh, and we were uh, we were uh, selecting pearls out of your uh, thoughts so thanks to all the part participants to be there to make it a lifetime experience thank you very much thank you thank you very much thank you thank you Anita Thank you very much everyone. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.